אשרף, לא רואים אותך ברור עכשיו. Welcome everyone. My name is Gabriella Golliger. I'm uh, the national chair of Canadian Friends of Peace Now. Yes, uh, we I are. Um, we are the uh, support organization for Shalom Achshav, Peace Now in Israel, which is uh, Israel's leading peace movement that promotes the two-state solution to the Israeli-Palestinian con conflict. You can find out more about us on our website, uh, peacenowcanada.org. Please consider supporting us with a donation. It's tax deductible and you can do it via our website. We rely entirely on donations from people like you. Uh, later in the webinar, we will have time for audience questions. Please type your questions in at any time using the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen. Please make your question as concise as you can. Uh, our webinar is being recorded and it will be posted to our website. Um, I also suggest that if you are on gallery view, you put yourself on speaker view so that you see each speaker individually as, we're, as the webinar goes. Uh, we have a really interesting guest uh, roster today. Uh, four amazing people, all with very impressive curriculum vitae and all dedicated to working for peace and a better future for their people. Uh, we have Ilan Baruch and Alon Liel, both of whom are retired Israeli ambassadors. We have Ashraf Adrami, formerly with the Palestinian Authority and now uh, with a Palestinian community organization. And we have Susie Becher, a high profile peace and human rights activist and co-founder of a new political party. Um, I won't go more into their credentials right now because I'd like to get right into the substance of our webinar. I'll just mention though, uh, for your interest that Ashraf, uh, because he had to be go through a, a rather long checkpoint is a bit late getting to his regular computer and that's why you see him in his car, but he will be joining us from his office shortly. So Alan, um, Ilan Alon and Susie are all members of an organization called the Policy Working Group. Uh, it's an Israeli organization. And so I'm gonna start with asking Ilan to tell us a little bit about the Policy Working Group. Uh, what is it? Um, what does it stand for and what are its goals? Ilan, over to you. Good morning, good morning, Canada. Good evening, Israel. Um, the the policy working group um, exists uh, just over one decade. It uh, is a, a coalition of um, uh, activists, individual activists who work together, and the common dominate denominator is uh, our conviction that um, the um, future of Israel depends on our relations with the Palestinians. Uh, the history so far is taking us in the wrong direction, but the Palestinians need to have an opportunity for full self-determination in a country of their own alongside Israel with a mutual recognition and uh, uh, cooperation. And uh, that, uh, uh, that means the two-state solution. There is, um, uh, it is currently very popular to question the two-state solution based on reality on the ground with all the settlements and the settlers and the infrastructure and we are fully aware of uh, the dangers to uh, the two-state solution. But for us, it is a principle that is uh, 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 giving us an orientation of our political work. We believe that in no other way but the two-state solution 
the human rights of the Palestinians can be preserved and respected. Any other way of Israeli dominance um, costs uh, the Palestinians with their human rights. And we see um, ex uh, accelerating forced evictions, um, expropriation of land, uh, and the uh, construction of uh, greater and greater presence of settlers and settlements and infrastructure serving settlements in the West Bank and East Jerusalem. So we picked up the UN Security Council Resolution 2334 of December 2016, which was supported by 14 members at the time, and with the American abstention rather than a veto, which was a, a signal of support. And um, we see in this uh, resolution uh, the, the, the essence of two-state solution. And I will put a full stop here. Thank you so much. Uh, for this introduction. So I'd like to go to Ashraf, unless Ashraf, you're having tr uh, trouble uh, driving and, and speaking at the same time, but if you can manage, I'd like to ask you, uh, what made you decide to work with these, these uh, Israelis, uh, with this Palestinian group? What motivated you? Uh, unfortunately, we suddenly are frozen. Nope. Uh, Ashraf, Ashraf, you are, uh, I think we're having trouble, some technical problems here, Ashraf. So just hold on to your, your, um, your thoughts and I'll get back to you in a few minutes because right now uh, the screen is frozen. For some reason, we're not, what, we're not seeing and hearing you. Um, and if, if you, if we, are managed to get you well, you know, just jump in. So um, I'm going to go to Alon then and, um, and, and ask him about the peace process that we currently have or peace building is, um, has been completely stalled for some time, Alon. Where do you think the situation is heading? Uh, I think it's uh, close to a, a decade now that we don't have talks with the Palestinians, uh, even not uh, indirect talks. It is uh, completely frozen and also shelved somewhere uh, in the memory of the Israeli public that hardly remembers uh, we once had talks. Um, this is very worrying uh, for us. We thought when we launched the uh, policy working group that uh, this situation is not sustainable. Israel is strong militarily, technologically, economically, but the whole situation of having uh, 5 million people under our control under our direct control, in fact, um, almost under siege in Gaza and even in the West Bank in a way, is not sustainable. It's not sustainable and will cost Israel dearly in the future. And we didn't know uh, how things will develop. Uh, we didn't know if the uh, if reaction will be mostly international reaction and putting pressure on us, or there'll be a, a violent uh, reaction on behalf of the Palestinians, or a, a economic uh, sanctions and so on. And all of this didn't happen. Israel had a wonderful decade uh, from these aspects of security and uh, um, economics. Uh, but it exploded in a, uh, in a way that uh, I, I think nobody 
foresaw, at least we didn't foresee, uh, it exploded uh, from the point of, of trying to eliminate the obstacles to perpetuate the occupation. The Israeli government felt that it cannot go on perpetuate the occupation under democratic rules and under human rights rules. And as you know, five months ago, uh, an earthquake, a political earthquake erupted in Israel with an attempt of the Likud to uh, change the democratic features of the country. And here came for the first time a reaction. It was not a reaction to the occupation, but it was in a way a reaction in our eyes, in my eyes, to the outcome of the occupation to the fact that the occupation is not sustainable. And I think here for the first time, the majority of Israelis who are pro-democracy uh, understands, or, or, or many of them understand now that uh, what we faced five months ago was uh, an attempt to change the rules of the game in order to perpetuate our control on the Palestinians. And, uh, but these are kind of my opening remarks. Uh, maybe Ashraf can, uh, can come into the picture now. Yes, please, um, Ashraf, let's see if, uh, I'd like to know what made you join the uh, these colleagues of yours. Uh, good morning. You hear me now? Yes. Did you hear me? Okay. So I'm. Uh, I apologize about the, the uh, lack of stability of big uh, share the interview. But uh, uh, I'll uh, within two minutes will be in my office. But I'll start with what uh, drove me to. Uh, participate with uh, Ilan and his colleagues in uh, the uh, policy working group activities. Uh, I am um, involved since 1996 of uh, relations with the uh, Israelis when I was uh, uh, the head of the Israeli department. Man in the Ministry of Okay, Sorry. Ashraf, we're cut, it's cutting out a bit. And since you're so close to your Asian. office, why don't we wait uh, till you're... Yeah, uh, Ashraf, if, I'm sorry to interrupt. The big uh, Palestinian Authority and... Uh, okay. Yeah, I, I think it'll be... Mark, yeah, well, we'll get back to you. I'm so sorry that we have to uh, interrupt you here, but um, uh, these are circumstances beyond your control and beyond ours. So we'll get back to you when you're you're in your office and uh, can speak more more easily. So thank you very much. Um, I'm going to uh, go over now over to Susie and ask her about uh, the mission statement of the PWG says you believe that the international community must become more involved in uh, breaking the impasse. And why do you feel the international community should be more involved? And uh, what can it do? And what countries specifically are you thinking about? Okay, first of all, thank you for inviting us. Um... I, I don't think you mentioned it in your opening remark. I'm a, born in Montreal, I'm a Canadian. So it, I've been living in Israel for close to 50 years, but it's very exciting for me to be addressing uh, this audience. Um, the short answer to your question is that we've, despite what Alon said about uh, the this mass movement that we're seeing around the judicial overhaul which is really a, an amazing phenomenon um the majority of those protesting 
do not have the occupation on their screens. There are some who do. There is a movement and, and apparently the numbers are growing, but not that significantly. The, the protests that you're seeing hundreds of thousands in the streets are about the, the the regime coup, as it's being called in our circles, and not about ending the occupation. Um, most of them are actually, most of the slogans are about going back to the wonderful democracy that we used to have in Israel. And from our point of view of the PWG, of our Palestinian partners, and of basically the Israeli peace camp, it wasn't such a democracy before either. Um, as you all well know, in the recent elections in Israel, and we've had a succession of them over the past couple of years, the word peace no longer even figured in any of the campaigns, including those of the left-wing parties, not Merits, not the Labour Party, nobody talks peace anymore. And as Alon correctly pointed out, the younger generation doesn't even know what the Oslo Accords were. They don't know what the Green Line is. Uh, successive years of right-wing governments have managed to change the discourse in Israel. When you listen to the news, they don't talk about the West Bank. They talk about Judea and Samaria. When they show the weather forecast, there's no Green Line. You see the settlement of Ariel on the map without any division between it and Haifa. Um, so the younger generation really has no awareness. And again, to repeat what Alon said, life here is really good. And the, the average Israeli um, doesn't see the occupation, doesn't know what's happening in the occupied territories. The only time they hear about Palestinians is if there's a terror attack. That's when you have something about Palestinians on the news. Other than that, the whole issue doesn't exist. And so with life here being so great, okay, it's kind of like la la land here. Um, we feel that the only way to wake people up is pressure from the outside. Now, we don't call for sanctions, but there are a lot of things that can be done. There are diplomatic steps can be taken. We see Biden not inviting Netanyahu. Like that's one of the worst things that you can do is uh, not entertain the, uh, the Israeli prime minister. A lot of countries, a lot of governments had said that they are treating Bitsala, Smotrich, and Itamar Benvir as persona non grata, but that's low hanging fruit. It's really Netanyahu who's responsible and represents the government. So uh, he can be treated in that way. Um, Elon mentioned resolution 2334. We call for strict implementation of 2334. Absolutely no interaction with any of the companies, communities, um, any entities that are acting or living beyond the green line in the occupied territories. Uh, when it comes to R&D, when it comes to student exchanges, there are a lot of things that can be done without actually getting to sanctions. Um, and we also feel, especially after what we've seen with the Western world getting together to confront Russia's invasion of Ukraine on the basis of upholding the rule of law and universal humanitarian values, those same criteria need to be applied to the state of Israel. The international community has a responsibility for itself if it's concerned with maintaining international law and the rule of law globally, then it has to apply it to Israel as well and not simply talk. Uh, I don't wanna to take too much time. So just quickly, I'll go into which countries. Well, of course, Israel is most sensitive to the United States. Um, we believe that the EU has a significant role also and should stop sitting around and waiting to see what Biden does, should act independently. Germany has a special role because of the Holocaust and the special relationship between Germany and Israel. And of course, I have to mention Canada, which is not 
vocal enough. Um, and if I can just give one example of where Canada really disappointed us, it was the vote at the UN on asking the International Court of Justice to give an advisory opinion on the legality of the occupation and Canada voted against it. This is just using, it was the Palestinians using the legal authorities that are at their disposal in order to question after 56, now going on to 57 years, can you still call this occupation temporary? And Canada voted against it. Oh, now let I see Ashraf's comfortable, so you can go to him. Exactly, Ashraf. So please, um, thank you. Thank you, Susie and Ashraf. Uh, go ahead and speak. Tell us about um, uh, why you wanted to work with these these Israelis with a policy working group. And any and and please feel free to respond to anything else that they've said uh, up to now. Okay. Good morning again, and uh, thank you for uh, inviting me to this uh, webinar. Uh, I was uh, involved in uh, Israeli-Palestinian relations uh, since uh, 1996, when I established the uh, Israeli disc in the Ministry of Information, early years of uh, establishing the Palestinian Authority and uh, the Oslo uh, uh, Accord the implementation within the Palestinian territories. Uh, now, uh, I have been in touch with Ilan Baruch uh, for a decade. Uh, now, 10 years we are working together. We, uh, he can uh, tell us uh, the story better than me, but uh, I think there is a need to act together as Palestinians and Israelis to save the two-state solution and to promote the peaceful process between the two sides. Because if we don't this effort, I think the situation becomes more difficult and complicated. Nowadays, uh, unfortunately, we are experiencing a very bad uh, uh, situation, especially after establishing the Israeli uh, uh, new government did by Benjamin Netanyahu and his allies, Smotrich and Ben Gvir. Uh, this government uh, tries to put an end of the two-state solution of this uh, concept uh, totally by uh, uh, annexation, the by annexing the Palestinian territories, uh, not just de facto, de jure. Uh, it means that they try to change the Israeli uh, political situation and the legal situation uh, of the uh, uh, control of these uh, settlements. And now they are uh, uh, in uh, this process uh, by uh, what is called the reform of ju ju judiciary uh, regime in, uh, in Israel. I think one uh, uh, part of this uh, reform is connected to what the uh, Israeli government wants to do in West Bank, mainly to change the status of West Bank to be a part of, at least part of it, part of Israel under the civil Israeli uh, law. And this uh, means that there is no chance to have uh, a Palestinian uh, independent state, uh, a viable state in West Bank and Gaza Strip. And now they are trying also to put as many as uh, settlers in the uh, West Bank uh, settlements, the uh, old and the new ones, they declared that they want to put about 1 million of settlers in West Bank to uh, uh, avoid the situation that any Israeli government can evacuate or withdraw from the uh, West uh, Bank. We also have uh, an internal problem 
as uh, Palestinians, uh, we have uh, a situation of lack uh, of democracy, lack of elections, the division between uh, Hamas movement and the Palestinian Authority. Hamas controls uh, Gaza Strip and use uh, violence as the only mean to uh, struggle against the occupation. And uh, uh, we are in a situation that the, the uh, internal uh, circumstances and conditions are also uh, so bad, not just uh, what we experienced from the Israeli government, the Israeli uh, occupier army and the uh, provocation of settlers, we also have our uh, internal uh, problems. I'll stop here and after that maybe may uh, answer any question. Okay. Um, I'll just ask you a quick question, uh, uh, Ashraf, and that is, I think some people think that, um, or there's some belief or confusion about Palestinians and Israelis working together in peace initiatives that there's a Palestinian um, uh, policy of not of uh, anti normalization. And uh, I just wonder if you would address that quickly for us just to clear that. Up. Yeah, yes, so we have a, a very strong anti normalization movement within the Palestinian territories and they uh, accuse uh, any Palestinian uh, who has connections with the Israelis, even if we are speaking about peace of collaborator with the occupation, unfortunately. But on the uh, official level, the President Mahmoud Abbas and the Palestinian Authority and the Palestinian leadership uh, uh, encourage the uh, connections between Israelis and Palestinians and the joint uh, activities. So there are uh, uh, here some kind uh, of divisions between the official position and the uh, popular one of the uh, anti-normalization movement led by uh, the uh, uh, movement of uh, uh, boycotting and uh, imposing sanctions against Israel, uh, BDS. Okay, thank you very much for that clarification. So I'm going to go back to your the uh, policy working group mission of of influence of getting some uh, international um, intervention going, and I'll I'll bring it back to Ilan to ask um, to speak about um, the missions. You, you've already done some work in Europe, and maybe you could tell us a little bit, bit about that. Uh, who have you met with and what sort of response have you had? Yes. Well, <clears throat> our key message, excuse me, <coughs> our, uh, our key message to our interlocutors is that the old paradigm by which the international community was offering assistance to the two parties, two protagonists, the moment they enter a peace process, facilitating such a process, that is obsolete. The disparity between Israel and Palestine is so enormous that the Palestinians have no, uh, no uh, power to uh, convince Israel to move into the negotiations room for a process that will be heading towards compromise. And in Israel, there is simply no desire for negotiations, no desire for a peace process. In recent years, but even more so in the last couple of months, the Israeli government is embarked on um, a unilateral process by which the Palestinians, not only on the ground, but also diplomatically and in the narrative hemisphere will be crushed, defeated. 
And we called for assistance from the international community, not as facilitators anymore, but as a party to a process, to a multilateral process with principles, bringing in principles. And uh, our desire is to uh, get uh, such countries like Canada uh, open-minded to our message that there is no, no time left anymore for the international community to wait for Israel and Palestine to get their act together because they have nothing in common to work for. Palestine has no, uh, no interest, no leverage, no leverage short of one, and that is violence on a magnitude. And if you go by a public opinion polls that are being conducted, surveyed systematically in Palestine by a high quality uh, institute led by Dr. Khalil Shikaki, you see that in the young generation, the people who are below 20 of age and did not experience a second intifada, there is a high popularity to the idea that Palestine could not be redeemed but by violence. And the people they are looking up to are the Hamas and the Islamic Jihad. And uh, I think if the international community is serious in its uh, declared desire to uh, create conditions for the dynamics of negotiations so that uh, violence will not pick up, um, then the time is now. And I want to remind our audience that Canada was in the past con conspicuous in its involvement with the peace process in the Middle East, mainly in the multilateral peace process that was launched right after the Iraq war and uh, in the Madrid conference. And Canada took uh, uh, the, it became the gavel holder of a very sensitive committee, working committee on refugees. And it was conducting, on top of this, it was conducting several development projects in Palestine on infrastructure, on water related infrastructure. And I think it is high time with this Canadian government to take a, another look um, at what is possible, not wait for Israeli consent or agreement, but move forward assertively, maybe not singularly, but in a coalition of international players to uh, readdress several aspects that uh, should be part of a larger process leading to an eventual reignition of the Middle East peace process. And that is what we are trying to do when, when we arrive in Canada. We are uh, eagerly looking forward to engage in conversations we have been in touch now for a long time with the Canadian uh, heads of mission, both in Israel and in Palestine. And we hope to achieve a situation whereby we get enough uh, material to uh, launch a continuous dialogue so that it is not just a one, one introductory arrival in Canada but that we will have an opportunity to um, have an impact. Thank and, you. Uh, 
your organization and all Jewish activists that are on our side are critical in uh, allowing us an effective uh, walk into the Canadian uh, awareness and, uh, and uh, goodwill and confidence in what we are trying to achieve, even if this is very much um, away from what the government of Israel and its uh, emissaries are uh, reflecting and that we will have an opportunity to do some good work. And we are very grateful to you for making it possible. Thank you. Um, thank you, uh, Ilana. And I, I'd like to, Alon now to, to enlarge a little bit on that theme. Uh, Alon, could you talk a bit about who you hope to meet with in Canada? I know you're, you're coming in October. I don't know how firm the plans are as yet, but who do you want to meet? Uh, a little bit about what you might want to say. And and I know, Alon, you are involved with a, a um, uh, an international, uh, um, you're involved with a number of organizations, but including something called J-Link. So maybe you could just say a little bit about how J-Link might be involved in this. Thanks. Uh... First, I would like a little bit to expand on what uh, Ilan said. Uh, first, the option of uh, massive uh, Palestinian violence uh, is catastrophic because with the balance of power in existence, it will be a disaster, a disaster, especially to them because uh, they have no way they can achieve something meaningful uh, by force. And this makes the diplomatic mission even more important because there is no way we can uh, close the gap uh, or minimize the gap on uh, the military side, on the technological side, on the economic side, but there is a way that we can upgrade the, the Palestinian situation diplomatically. And most of the countries in the world recognize Palestine. The bottleneck is the West. The bottleneck is Western Europe and North America. This is the bottleneck. And in Western Europe, there is only one country that courageously recognized Palestine, and this is Sweden. Countries are very uh, reluctant to confront Israel directly, to call for sanctions on uh, products of settlements and so on, because Israel is a powerful country. Israel is a regional power, and countries uh, are uh, afraid to lose Israel as a source of intelligence and a source of weapons and commerce and investments and so on. So I think it will be easier for the international community to change the attitude, to upgrade the attitude to the Palestinians instead of confronting Israel directly. And just one more sentence, there is no way that international pressure can force the sides to the, to the same room today because nothing can come out of it with the existing conditions. The only way you can do it is if you somehow create a parity of esteem between the two sides. If there is a, a, a level of recognition of the two sides diplomatically that gives the Palestinians their honor and explains Israel that the world is not going to forget uh, about this issue. Uh, regarding uh, Canada and regarding jailing, uh, I think it was after five years that the policy working group was already functioning that we thought we should approach also the liberal Jewish communities around the globe. So in fact, jailing was born in inside the PWG, I was the one that uh, pushed for it saying that uh, in a way, 
after so many years as an Israeli official, and uh, I was born in Israel, I feel much closer to liberal Jews outside Israel than to the average Israeli. And, and I felt that if this will go on, that Israel will deviate from democratic rules, the, the Jewish world will, be, will end up torn apart into two separate Jewish worlds, the religious messianic nationalistic one and the liberal pluralistic democratic one, two separate Jewish worlds. And I, although I'll go on living in Israel, will be closer to the liberal part that is mostly living in the United States. And we started uh, approaching uh, communities abroad. Uh, the American community, as you know, is quite uh, organized uh, under the framework of J Street. And we thought that it should include all other communities, including Canada. And we found in Canada organizations like uh, J Space and uh, Canadian Friends of Peace Now and a Canadian uh, New Israel uh, Fund and so on, that we, with which we, we felt uh, clo very close to. And the same in South Africa and the same in Australia and the same in Argentina and in Brazil and in Italy and in France. It was in no place the majority of the community. In no place it was the establishment of the community, but it was the more moral, as I see, it, the more conscious part of the community regarding the injustice that Israel is inflicting on the Palestinians. And we created J-Link. And today J-Link is operative and in, in the communities where we see positive feedback regarding Canada. Allow me one sentence because I want uh, Ashraf and Susie to come in also. We already uh, communicated with the Canadian Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Uh, the visit is uh, fully coordinated. And uh, we are not coming like the Minister of, uh, uh, Diaspora Minister of Israel, uh, uh, Shikli, that embarrassed a big part of the uh, Jewish community in Canada. We, we are coming with an approach that we want to explain what's going on in Israel today, uh, that the fact that the majority of Israelis are right-wingers and the democratic trend is toward a more religious and conservative Israel, uh, it was uh, uh, in a way faced with, a, with a, an unbelievable uh, wave or democratic wave uh, that protests what the Israeli government has manufactured on many levels, especially on the democratic field. We are coming to explain this too, and I see this as very, very strongly related to the struggle against the occupation. Okay. Thank you so much. Uh, I'm just going to ask two more questions, one of Susie, one of Ashraf, and then get into some audience questions. Um, and Susie uh, and, and Alona sort of uh, alluded to this a little bit. Uh, going back now to Israel, one of, I know your, your focus is the international community, but it's still, I think a lot of people are have on their mind and myself too. How do you, the, the trend in Israel is so right wing, especially among youth. What needs to happen to change the mindset there? Because that, is where it has to happen. Um, that's a really tough question. Um, and I put it to a lot of people. Well, I was thinking about it in preparation for this webinar and most of the, to peace activists, okay? And most of the answers that I got were related to long-term steps, which I support. The basic thing is, dialogue, people to people, encounters, and of course, education. Um, the Jewish Israelis need to be taught 
that there was a Nakba, that it's okay to recognize that it happened. Um, Jews all over the world, especially I grew up in the diaspora, so I know that I was taught about all the Arabs who ran away in 1948, and today I know what measures were taken to expel a large part of them. So re-education, education about the narrative of the other, and, and, and as well for the Palestinian Israelis, for them, their school system also to uh, educate on, on the Jewish narrative. Um, but that's long-term and I don't think that we have time. I have a real sense of urgency. Alon alluded to it, Elon alluded to it, Ashraf alluded to it. Violence on a massive scale is hanging over our heads. And the only way, in my opinion, for that to change within Israel is if Israelis start feeling the, that there's a cost associated with the occupation. Um, and I just want also when Elon talked about polls and he was referring specifically, there's a new poll that came out today by Khalil Shkaki and there's one really, there are many frightening statistics in it, but the thing that got me is that 66% of Palestinians believe that Israel, which just celebrated its 75th anniversary, won't be around for its 100th. And there are pe these people who teach about international relations and conflict resolution always say that you get peace when both sides feel that they can't achieve their objectives militarily. And this poll shows that more and more Palestinians believe that through violence, that's the only way to get what they want. And the new Israeli government guidelines that talk that the West Bank, of course, sorry, Judea and Samaria were given to the Jewish people exclusively by God, also show that the majority of Israelis believe that we can beat the Palestinians. And that trend is the trend that has to be reversed. People need to understand that there's no military solution. Okay, thank you, Susie. And, and Ashraf, I will ask you a similar question about uh, Palestinians, especially Pan Palestinian youth. What will it take them, what will it take to convince them that a two-state solution is possible? And, and um, you know, Susie just brought up the a kind of a paradox where she's saying that that um, Israelis won't be convinced that they need to change anything until they feel some pain, and that's what uh, a lot of Palestinians want to inflict. Uh, so, how will that? How do you change that equation? Because and, and yeah, go ahead. Gabrielle, I'm sorry, I just need one short time. I want to clarify, I wasn't calling for violence. No, I know you weren't calling for it. I'm just saying that there's some, there's a paradox there, though. That, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, yes, uh, I think that uh, the uh, majority of uh, uh, young people, Palestinian young people, uh, thinks that uh, there is no way to change the uh, situation on the occupied territories. Uh, but uh, by by violence, uh, this is uh, a trend, a new trend, and uh, it became such a trend because uh, lack of the international intervention. Uh, Palestinian people now don't uh, hope that the international community will intervene to stop the occupation and to change the status in the Palestinian territories. And I, I think the only way to change this trend is to have real and strong international intervention. Uh, because uh, Palestinian people think that the uh, only way that the Israel uh, may or maybe should uh, withdraw from the uh, Palestinian territories is uh, just by violence. Uh, unfortunately, the uh, 
the examples that Israel showed the Palestinians that there was withdrawal from Egypt after October war. And the withdrawal from South Lebanon is after the resistance of Hezbollah and the other uh, Lebanese organization. And also the uh, evacuating of Gaza Strip, the settlements in Gaza Strip and withdrawal from Gaza after the uh, uh, violence uh, was uh, adopted by Hamas and other movements in Gaza against settlers. So uh, this, uh, maybe this fact, uh, unfortunately affect people, uh, people, especially when there is a lack of this uh, kind of intervention. So we want to see uh, intervention two levels. One is to recognize a Palestinian independent state on 1967 borders as uh, Sweden uh, uh, did. And the other thing is we want to see emphasize uh, 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 of the uh, uh, nine, uh, two, three, three, four uh, uh, Security Council resolution to prevent any kind of Israeli violation of the international law and this resolution mainly, especially to widen the uh, settlements and to evacuate Palestinian uh, residents uh, uh, fr from the uh, uh, West Bank and like Khan Ahmar and others, and to put a red line for the Israeli government as the American administration did uh, uh, many times, and they succeeded to prevent the uh, Israeli continuous uh, uh, policy against Palestinians, especially in Al Khan Al Ahmar and uh, uh, near to uh, East Jerusalem. So, we want such kind of intervention that the international community should say to the Israeli government, "You should stop all your." Uh, uh, settlement uh, activities and uh, changing the status in the Palestinian occupied territories, and you should respect the resolution 2334. This kind of intervention uh, can uh, uh, maybe save the hope of two state solution and can change the trend that the only violence can change the situation uh, between Palestinians and Israelis. Yeah, thank you. And Elon wants to jump in and say something, so please feel free. Go ahead. Very briefly, um, we did not uh, mention human rights, or hardly did we mention human rights so far. And uh, um, here the war in Ukraine comes to play. The international community is split into two. And the Atlantic uh, 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 group of nations is emphasizing the motivation of assisting Ukraine against Russia by uh, mentioning the fact that Russia has uh, engaged in war crime. It has violated the Ukrainian human rights it has violated the rule of law that is governing since World War II, the international community. These are threats far reaching beyond the horizon. It's not just the concrete war on the ground. It is a war on the system. Now, we, came to understand that when we talk to interlocutors and we make the comparison between Palestine and Ukraine, Europeans tend to push back and say, do not compare, it does disservice to your cause. But uh, once the war is over, it will be our task to generate enough concern internationally to the uh, case of Israel-Palestine, where 
a member nation of the democratic liberal hemisphere is chronically, continuously, and uh, in escalation, uh, violating the human rights of another nation, where the ethnic seam line actually generates the image of apartheid. And uh, we, we need to work very hard to harness the international demand of Russia to cease all human rights violations in Ukraine to the assistance of removing the conflict between Israel and Palestine. Once a two-state solution is in place, the end to human rights violations will be in place. And indeed, the, uh, the end to apartheid will be in place. So two-state solution is not only an issue of what's going on on the ground. It is also an issue of world order that need, we need to uh, stress in our conversations when we come over to Canada. Okay, thank you. Um, so we have a few minutes uh, for some audience questions and I'd like to uh, jump in quickly and um, I'm not gonna take them all in order. And uh, so forgive me for that. And we may not get to them all. I'm gonna start with one from uh, Banafshe Zia. I hope I pronounced your uh, name correctly, Banafshe. Um, and thank you for joining us. And she asks, if a Palestinian state is established, would Palestinians be open to having set the settlements as part of their state? So I think uh, I'd like Ashraf to address that and anyone else who wants to jump in on it. Go ahead. I don't think that Palestinians will accept uh, settlements a part of the Palestinian state. We can accept Jews as uh, citizens of the Palestinian state, equal citizens of Palestinian state, but not Israeli settlements within the Palestinian state. We cannot accept any other uh, uh, country uh, uh, sovereignty or uh, uh, maybe replacing our uh, control of our lands. So uh, we, we, in, we, when we speak about uh, uh, two-state solution, we also uh, try to settle the uh, question of uh, settlements. And because of that, there is land swap. The land swap is uh, uh, adopted by the Palestinian leadership to make it easy for any Israeli government to evacuate the uh, isolated settlements from uh, the uh, depth of the West Bank and to annex the uh, blocks of settlements uh, uh, which are close to the border like Malay Adumim, Gevadzev, and Gush Sion, but not all settlements in West Bank because uh, this intended to uh, prevent any kind of contiguity between the Palestinian territories. And so we can accept the Jews as a part of the Palestinian state, like Palestinians a part of the Israeli state but not settlers, not Israeli settlers, if they want to choose to uh, be or to live in our state as equal citizens, we are welcome back. Thank you, Afshra. So uh, I'd like to, uh, uh, Susie would like to say something and then maybe we'll get some other questions in. Thanks. Okay, I'll uh, try and be brief. Um, there's been a shift in the nature of the settlement movement. When the settlement movement started, it was largely ideological and it was supported by the Israeli government at the time, largely for security reasons, okay? I'm not defending that perception, but that's mostly what drove them. Um, over time, 
there was a change, uh, simply uh, something very pragmatic, which is that real estate in the occupied territories was very cheap in the settlements, it was very cheap. There were settlements that were established very close to Tel Aviv. They were advertised as being like a seven minute drive from Tel Aviv. And so you had, because real estate in Israel proper is so expensive, you had a lot of young people who simply for economic reasons were buying homes in the settlements. After the second intifada, it started changing again. And today settlement is deeply ideological. It's fundamentalist. It's people who really believe God gave us this land and the Palestinians have no right to be there and we have to go forth and take it over. And so recognizing settlements today, it's not a simple question of land or, or, or negotiate territorial negotiations. There's such a heavy fundamentalist extreme extremist religious aspect to it. I'm saying this for, for our audience's knowledge that they should understand why there would be such opposition to allowing settlements to remain in place. Okay, thank you. Um, <clears throat> okay, quickly uh, from Barbara Lando. Uh, she is wondering about specific uh, initiatives that could, or projects, that could um, be helpful in promoting peace uh, uh, and goodwill that that both sides could somehow cooperate on. There are co uh, there are such shared initiatives happening, and and maybe Alon, I'll, I'll ask you to talk about this. She's saying, you know, there's climate and healthcare and um, and uh, educational um, and youth uh, initiatives. Are are these things um, uh, how 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 effective can they be? Do you think? Uh, you're you're muted. Sorry, <laughs> Alon. Good. I think uh, there are a variety of issues that uh, will be relatively new to the Canadian uh, public. I think uh, the issue of uh, one state, two states is. Uh, probably discussed uh, uh, all over in uh, the governmental rooms and uh, with the Jewish communities. But uh, I think we should also highlight during our visit some issues that are less known in Canada. For instance, the Jerusalem situation. The fact that over one third uh, of the Jerusalemites Jerusalem inhabitants of the Jerusalem city inhabitants have no representation in the in Jerusalem. Uh, close to 400,000 Jerusalemites have no one council member and didn't have a council member in the last 40 years. So uh, I think when you are trying to explain the absurd in, uh, in the Israeli system, the Jerusalem situation is uh, very important for us to highlight. Another issue is the, the Jewish Arab situation inside Israel, the nation state law, the fact that the Israeli government of today is speaking in terms of Jewish supremacy, Jewish supremacy, which is so strange to us Sabras born in Israel, uh, and this is these are senior ministers that see the Arab citizens of Israel as inferior, and as a result of it, now there is a new Jewish Arab party emerging, in which uh, uh, the party is based on equal terms, equal representation, and uh, mutual recognition of the narratives. And so I think I think these are only two examples and there are more. What we'll try to do is to elaborate the discussion in Canada and include things that the Canadian uh, government and the Canadian politicians and the Canadian Jewish community 
uh, doesn't have uh, enough information about. I'm going to ask, oh, okay, Susie, go ahead. Well, what I wanted to say is I'm going to ask each of you um, to give a very brief uh, uh, sort of what your hopes and dreams and worst fears are. Uh, but before I do that, uh, I'm, uh, but before you do that, I'm just going to make some uh, final cl closing remarks of my own. But Susie, if you want to respond to what Alan said, go ahead. Uh, yeah, I, I just want to expand on and try and get hone in more on Barbara's question, uh, because I read earlier today some report related to a birthright trip of Canadian youth that they had put them up. Something happened with the accommodations and a couple of them were put up in a settlement and they didn't realize that they were in the settlement. So now they change the conditions for birthright that they have to be more transparent about where people are staying and stuff, uh, which I think is very important. Again, as I said earlier, educating the youth that there is a green line and then that's what the international community recognizes as the division between the state of Israel and the Palestinian territories. And um, I, I think that it's important for a Canadian audience, when you're sending your children on programs like Birthright or other things that are similar, to make sure that the programs are balanced that they're not just have a Nagila, but that there's uh, an introduction into the situation of the Palestinians, the fact that there is a conflict, the fact that Israel does hold these territories since the war in 1967, that it's disputed area, even if birthright can't say occupation, but just to, to raise awareness. I think it's very important for parents to insist that their children get a comprehensive picture of what's happening here. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, I'm going to, um, I'm going to say my quick, um, wrap up remarks, but then I'd like you to say a few things afterwards yourselves. So I, because I, I don't want to miss the opportunity to, to thank you uh, from the bottom of my heart for participating in this webinar. Uh, each of you, uh, we could have had a, a webinar with just one of you, and it would have been a very worthwhile webinar, and maybe we will get you to come uh, as individuals. Um, uh, so, so thank you. You've you've brought a lot of insight and and I, for me, uh, um, encouragement and and uh, inspiration um, to this this work that we do. Uh, I want to remind our audience that uh, Canadian Friends of Peace now relies on individual donations. So, if you feel moved uh, to help us with our work, including webinars like this one please go to our website and uh, send a donation, big or small. They're tax deductible. Um, and uh, to all four of you, we are really looking forward to your mission in Canada and, and whatever we can do uh, as individuals or an organization to support you. And then I now I'd like to very briefly ask you each to tell me in 30 seconds, if you can, your, your hopes your hopes, your dreams, your worst fears, and I'll start with Ashraf here. I hope to see three things. One is uh, to change the Israeli government, and I hope that the protest movement will help to change the Israeli government to have a reasonable one in Israel, uh, maybe go to a peaceful agreement, or at least uh, negotiations between the two sides. Uh, the second thing is international intervention, maybe the uh, occasion of the uh, war between Russia and uh, Ukraine, maybe uh, it will help after a while to have uh, such kind of intervention. I hope that it will be before we uh, uh, go to uh, massive violence, the third one, I hope to have uh, uh, Palestinian uh, elections and uh, Palestinian unity between uh, Hamas and Fatah and the Palestinian Authority uh, also. 
because it is very important for us to uh, make Hamas uh, engaged in the uh, Palestinian political uh, legitimacy as a legitimate party uh, with uh, a commitment to PLO program. It is very important for Palestinians and Israelis alike. Thank you. Thank you. I'll go to Ilan, same kind of question. Well, <clears throat> my, my desire is to find a way to uh, convince the international community to uh, embrace a global proactive diplomacy of multilateral um, nature that uh, will shift the, the conflict from um, a clash between two belligerents, one very powerful, one very weak, into a, a diplomatic process. And uh, this is achievable. And uh, I'm convinced it is achievable and that uh, we should focus and dedicate all our resources, our intellectual resources, our time, and our fraternity with uh, our Palestinian uh, comrades to uh, convince the international community uh, to go this way. And uh, our desire in Canada is to get Canada on board. Thank you. Um, Alon, I'll let. My hopes uh, focus at the moment mostly on the Israeli internal situation. Uh, what happened in the last five months, we changed the discourse here from a left and right or a pro-peace or anti-peace to pro-democratic and anti-democratic. And once we, the discourse is on the issue of democracy, you find a, a new type of majority. A people who, who uh, in the last two, three decades felt that they are, they are losing uh, power, suddenly see that when they unite around the issue of democracy, they can win. And Israel doesn't need a change. It needs a U-turn. And I hope that the protest will not stop by blocking the aspirations for a messianic large Israel, but by creating a U-turn to switch Israel into a full democracy that is taking care of the human rights of all its citizens and of its neighbors. And this will trigger things that we could not imagine even a year, a year ago. Thank you. And, and Susie, I'll give you the last word. Okay, I'll try and be brief, but I have to give you two answers. There's the strategic answer and the tactical answer. So strategically, my big fear is war and my big hope is peace. Um, on the more tactical level, um, my fear may surprise some people is normalization with Saudi Arabia. I fear the whole normalization process with the Gulf states, its expansion, the US now appointing a special envoy for the Abraham Accords is playing into um, building and strengthening this bubble in which the younger generation in Israel lives and in which it thinks that it can just go about its business and everybody's going to play nice with us. So I very wor I worry a lot about uh, bolstering uh, that kind of thinking. And my hope lies in unpredictability. 
something that we can't see. When we look at it, the Elon always says, we think linear. <laughs> this will lead to this will lead to this. And when I think like that, I don't see anything good down the road, but history has shown us, I was a history major, things come out of left field, something that you didn't anticipate, a person that wasn't foreseen, a thought, an idea, an event. And so I think that unknown element is one of the things that can save us. That's what gives me hope. Yeah, no. Re regarding what Susie just said, I highly recommend to read the last article of Tom Friedman comparing the dynamics in Israel versus the dynamics on, in Saudi Arabia and his conclusions. Uh, so please, please, if we can find a way to send it to everybody who participated in the webinar, uh, please, uh, let's do it. Okay, we'll do it for sure not just those who participated in the webinar, but our whole list. So um, thank you, I'm going to wrap up. Uh, we've run out of time, I'm sorry to say. Thank you so much again, the four of you. Thank you to our audience. Uh, stay tuned and uh, we'll hope to see you again soon uh, for a future webinar. Um, this recording will end in a moment and, uh, and then the webinar will be over and We'll be saying goodbye to you, to all of you. Thank you again. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank very you. Much. Thank you, Gabriella. Thank uh -huh. you.